This video will discuss solar panels, house batteries, charge controllers, and power inverters in great detail. Here is a look at a typical solar panel. In the bottom right corner insert shows the cabling on the back of the panel which is used to connect it to your solar array. Here are the specifications for a typical 300 watt solar panel. You want to pay particular attention to the max power voltage and the max power current because that's the optimum power out of this particular panel. Notice that if you multiply 32.9 times 9 you get approximately 300 watts. Another consideration here is the open circuit voltage so that affects what you can apply it to and the short circuit current which determines how much current the wiring has to be able to handle in case something goes wrong. If you connected two of these panels in parallel, then the max power point would be 32.9 volts and 18 amps. If instead you connected two of these panels in series, then the max power point would be 79.8 volts and retains the 9 amp current capability. Solar panels are also greatly affected by the temperature of the solar panel itself. This chart shows the temperature range from 10 degrees centigrade up to 70 degrees centigrade. This is a 50 watt solar panel. You notice at 10 degrees it puts out 53.8 watts and at 70 degrees centigrade it only puts out 39.3 watts with a constant current load. So this shows how the voltage falls off as the temperature rises of the solar panel. It is not at all unusual to notice 30% increases in solar panel output during the cold winter months. The solar panel output is also affected by the sun intensity and the angle of the sun. So all these factors must be considered when installing your solar panel. It's wise to keep the solar panel so that air can circulate all around the solar panel. In other words, keep it elevated. Don't put it down flat against some metal surface that gets hot because that will reduce the solar power production. These are the batteries we chose to use for our house batteries. Notice there's some funny stuff going up here in the description of the battery. It says 12 volts, 100 amp per hour for 10 hours. Yet it's a 200 amp per hour battery. So what does that mean? As you may already know, most batteries except for lithium ion batteries shouldn't be discharged below 50% of their capacity. So here we have a 200 amp hour battery. And if you notice the top of this table here, it says 10 hours at 10 amps that discharges at halfway. So that's 100 amper hours. 10 hours times 10 amps is 100 amper hours. And you notice as the, as the load current increases, it would go right across the table here. You know, so when we get over to a 60 amp load, that only lasts for one hour. The amount of discharge rate determines the amper hour rating under load. Notice that this battery has a virtual 110 amper hour rating under the 60 amp load. Notice in this chart for this gel cell battery how dramatic the temperature affects the life of the battery. Worth considering when you're installing your battery, don't put it where the battery's going to get hot and can't get rid of its heat. And don't install it in a hot location. This chart also shows how the cold temperatures affect the capacity of the battery. So you don't want the battery too hot, you don't want the battery too cold. Notice in this chart how it shows that the depth of discharge severely affects the number of recharge cycles in the life of this battery. Just like the solar, solar panels explained earlier, these house batteries can connect, be connected in series or in parallel, depending upon your requirements. If you need massive current for a short period of time, you put them in parallel. If you want to reduce current losses for lighter loads, you can put them in series. For example, a lot of people are using golf cart batteries, 6 volt batteries, two of them in series to get to 12 volts. So how you connect is your business, but remember your charge controller has to be able to work with whatever connection you come up with. And last but not least, gassing batteries are explosive and dead shorts on batteries can also make them blow up if they have hydrogen off-gassing. So keep that in mind when you make your battery choice. Whenever we're plugged into shore power, we want a marine battery charger to charge the batteries on days that there's not much sunlight. This helps keep the batteries topped off 
anytime we have shore power. We use the same charger running through a, a vehicle inverter to charge the batteries while we're driving. By using this method, we have a charger that's designed for our gel cells. You can pick whatever battery type you use. It does the four-stage profile charging cycles. So the battery is treated as it expects to be treated, and this extends the life of the battery because it's being charged properly. This shows how the battery charger is connected to my two batteries. Our solar cells, when the sun is shining, can also keep our batteries topped off using this Rover 40 amp MPPT charger. These MPPT chargers are an interface between the solar panels and the battery. We've mentioned that the solar panels have a maximum power point, well batteries have a maximum charge point also. And the purpose of the MPPT controller is to match the maximum battery charge rate to the maximum power point of the solar panels. The MPPT simplified explanation is that there's a DC inverter. It takes the DC from the solar panels, it chops it up into about 80 kilohertz, then it rectifies it back down to a new DC voltage, which is the voltage the battery needs. So in our previous examples of the batteries, the 300 watt panel would take its 30 some odd volts, whatever it is, and the MPPT will drop it down to the 13.6 volts that the battery requires. And since there's a voltage reduction, power equals voltage times current. Therefore, if there's a voltage reduction, you get a current increase. So the, the battery wants current. That's what it wants. So it's getting more current with this matching of the MPPT between the solar panel and the battery. So you basically get a power gain as far as charging goes. Notice in this charging table under the gel column how the voltage of the MPPT is varied to meet the different charging requirements. 14.2 volts, 13.8 volts, 13.2 volts, and then reconnect to 12.6 volts. So the charger automatically takes care of this gel cell. And as long as the solar panels are producing an excess of 17 or 18 volts, then this MPPT controller can maximize the current charge into the battery pack or battery bank, whichever you have. So this way you get maximum power being charged to the batteries. Here are the electrical parameters of this Rover 40. Notice that the nominal system voltage can be 12 or 24 volts and it automatically recognizes that. The rate of battery current cannot exceed 40 amps. That's how much current this Rover 40 can stuff into the battery. The rated load current has to do with the load con connection port, the load connection port on the Rover 40. You can only pull 20 amps through this port. And then the maximum battery voltage is 32 volts. So in our previous example, if you took three of those 300 watt solar panels, you'd exceed the max solar input voltage of this unit. The max solar power would also be exceeded because the limit here is 520 watts if you're on a 12 volt battery system and 1040 watts if you're on a 24 volt battery system. So if you're 24 volts, you'd be okay. If you're running a 12 volt system, then you just exceeded the limits of this MPPT. The self-consumption has to do with how much energy the MPPT uses from the solar panel just to operate in this particular case, it's less than 100 milliamps at 12 volts. And the charge circuit voltage drop is the voltage drop across the terminals of this MPPT when it's connected to a battery. And the discharge circuit voltage drop is the voltage across the terminals of the MPPT load connection terminals when it's connected to a load. Equalization is only required when you have acid lead acid batteries and it's a way of fixing the cells they build up corrosion it's one way to put it over a period of time so this blasts all the corrosion corrosion off the cells they call that equalization if you're interested you can pause the video and read this section here's a chart of all the 
mode options for this MPPT controller. Uh, we choose mode number, setting number 15. We manually turn the load on and off. The load is all the circuit breakers and switches that run DC items inside our van. This controller also has many built-in safety features. As you can see by this list here, they cover just about everything you could possibly think of. So the, the controller itself is a major safety factor. And now we're going to talk about the inverter which converts the house battery DC voltage into normal AC power to use with appliances within your van. We chose a 2000 watt model and we suspect that will meet our power requirements. The bigger the inverter, the more idle current it draws just to sit there and do nothing when it's turned on. So we decided 2000 watts would have minimal idle current and still meet our needs. We chose this modified sine wave power inverter because we've had the same product, 3000 watt version, and it worked just fine. Didn't bother the television, didn't bother anything. Today, most all items have a wall wart which converts the 100 volt, 10 volts AC into DC. So it really has no impact on those devices. Here is a chart from the manufacturer of this inverter telling you how to calculate the inverter size requirements for your appliances. Here are the inverter specifications. You notice it's a 2000 watt inverter plus it produces 10 watts of USB power. Surge capacity, which is called the peak, is 4000 watts. It can take double the surge for a short period of time. Rated input DC voltage and amps is 12 volts DC, 215 amps. And I could read all the list, but you can read it yourself. Uh, down here it says fuse A, amperage of the fuse, there's 640 amp fuses inside, they're all in parallel. So 640 is 240 amps it can put out. It can consume, I should say, it consumes up to 240 amps, but it's rated for 215 amps as shown above. And they have the operating temperature and the weight and all the other stuff. Notice that in the middle here, it says optimum efficiency 90% minimum. So you're not, not going to get any less than 90% of what you put into it. So if the battery puts in 2,000 watts, 1,800 watts that will be the minimum that you get out of this unit. Here the manufacturer provides a table showing the minimum gauge wire and the minimum fuse size that, size that should be installed. Most of the 2,000 watt inverter, you should use number two gauge wire and 200 amp inline fuses. Our installation uses zero gauge wire with 200 amp fuses, one fuse for each battery. Listed here are some appliance cautions you should be aware of. It'd be recommended that you pause this video and read through these cautions to make sure you don't get yourself in trouble while using anybody's inverter. And this concludes our general overview of solar requirements. If you want to use solar panels, charge controllers, batteries, and inverters. Hopefully if you watch this video a few times it will all start making sense to you. So good luck with your solar system.